Singers that are here open with victory in Jesus. It's our theme song this particular month. Sister Molly, please. Thank you so much. Let's take our hymn books, page number 66. Bear with me this morning. I'm going to be leading the music. So if I mess up, just act like it's good. Amen. Just make sure you give a good shout amen and cover that up there. Page number 66. If you're able, let's all stand and we're going to sing at Calvary. Page number 66. Years I spent in vanity and pride. On that first verse, everybody's singing. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. needs to be a reality as we sing that. It says, now I give to Jesus everything. I tell you, that's the best thing you can do in your life. When you come to that place and you weigh out yourself between him and you realize it's all about him. Well, four of you agree with me anyway. Maybe we need to sing that verse on the fourth. Now I give to Jesus everything.
Ghost makes me want to grab everybody and say, come on up here. And we sing to nobody, but that's, we're really singing to the Lord, amen? All right, let's turn forward just, or excuse me, backwards just a little bit. How about page number 56? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Page number 56 on the first verse. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Say hi to somebody. God bless you. Welcome to church. sing this morning all of our special music. They do a wonderful job and I really appreciate the, the talent the Lord gives them for honoring his name. This song is titled All Is Well.
forget after church today we're going to be having uh, lunch for you it's not a just a major meal but it'll be a good lunch so they're out there preparing now a uh, good crews out there getting things in order for us so and brother bill's going to come for some announcements god bless you brother bill I'd like to just take this time and welcome each and every one of you here this morning we just pray that the services will be a blessing to you and we just got we do have a few announcements like the pastor was saying we do have our last cookout for the summer here and it will be out underneath the pavilion here so after the services if you're able to join us we'd like to have you and then tonight is uh, youth night there will be special activities for the kids during the p.m. service and then Thursday night September the 5th at 6 30 is the uh, night of visitation if you're able to come out for that and if you do have kids uh, there will be child care uh, provided for those that need it. And then men on September the 7th at 8, 8, 8 a.m., we are going to be having our uh, men's prayer breakfast. And any of the men that haven't been to this, this is the time that we start off with a little bit of fellowship. And then we do devotion. And then we uh, have a breakfast. And then if you're able to stay afterwards, uh, to go out and do visitation, you're more than welcome to do that also. And then the uh, missionary of the week is Brother David Marlowe. He's a missionary of Argentina. We want to continue to lift up our missionaries, and we want to lift up him and his family as they're out witnessing and just continue to uh, serve God. Yes. And our ministry of the week is our cleaning crew and our groundskeeper keepers. We want to continue to lift them up as... Uh, we are uh, stewards to keep uh, this place uh, neat and clean for our visitors and uh, to thank God for his uh, giving us this building and that to be able to come here and worship and to witness in. So that's, that's all I have today. But again, if you're able to stay, we'd be glad to have you for the dinner. I'm going to stay. Brother James is a professional. This is what he does for a living. And I, I, I didn't know you could be a professional cook, but you know, we are living in, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Everybody's got a place, amen? But he is a professional cook. Am I, is that right, Danielle? He is a professional cook. It's what he does for a living. So you'll enjoy what he does out there. Now, I can't vouch for anybody else because I think most of that stuff came from Kroger, but you should know about that. So we're looking forward to that. And then next Saturday, Brother Bill, if I heard you right, is our men's prayer breakfast. I think he moved out. He probably is helping them out here outside. But next Saturday, we meet at 8.30, men, and we'll get started about a quarter till nine. We have a devotion, and then from there, we'll go out to get something to eat, and then we typically go out soul winning and do some ministry work. So that's next Saturday, all of our men. We're looking forward to that. Brother Marvin, why don't you go ahead at this time and lead the men forward. Now... 
I want to make sure we understand as well that next week we'll have the total number tallied up for the giving that was taken in because some folks are still giving toward the note and we're wanting to take up an offering to go toward the note and then we're going to match that with our savings and then uh, there's been some money come in, I think $10,000 for um, uh, giving some people some permission. We discussed that business Wednesday. To, to maintenance a piece of property, and they're going to give the church a, a gift of 10000 That's going to go toward um, the notes. So next week, we should have all them notes together and give you the final tally and then bring everything to your attention. Brother John, good to see you today. God bless you. Good to see Brother Marvin. Good to see Brother Jerry. And good to see Brother Scott. And it is good to see you as well. And let's pray and ask for the Lord's blessings upon the day and the fellowship. Father, we are thankful and grateful for what you do in our lives and what you have done and what you've promised to do. We do pray that you'll bless these services here today, our fellowship together. We do pray that you'll bless the preparing of the food and the work that's all taking place outside with the men and the women who are laboring on setting things up, that you'll bless there. We do want to pray today that you'll bless those working in the nursery and those working in primary church right now. Uh, We want to pray, God, for the music to come. We want to pray for the preaching to come. We want to pray for the preaching this evening, that you'll bless, guide, and direct there. And as we take this offering up this morning, we do pray and ask that you'll bless both the gift and the giver. God bless our missions giving, our free will giving, our tithing. We pray that you'll use everything that we take up today for your honor and for your glory. And thank you for being so gracious and so kind and so good to us over and over and over again. We pray that you'll bless these services and we pray that the Holy Spirit will work in our hearts and bless our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. God's grace is sufficient, no doubt about that. The book of Jonah today, we're just about done. I told you it's going to be just a short series, but we want to look at something today. It's very, very laid out in the book of Jonah. It's a wonderful truth, and we're going to be looking at chapter 3 and going right into chapter 4. Jonah chapter number 3. We're going to be talking today about the salvation of the Lord is of God's pure love. The salvation of the Lord is is of God's pure love. And we're going to try to advance on this particular thought with the preaching. 
Let's have the ladies sing right before the message, a wonderful truth that teaches us to just trust in God, that he knows the way, he knows everything, he doesn't think like we think. We need to surrender to him and his lordship and his leadership. Let's have the ladies sing. what the prophet Isaiah said, didn't he? My thoughts are not your thoughts. That's why we trust him. And I can tell you, he'll never let you down. He'll never let you down. <clears throat> the book of Jonah, chapter number three, and we are going to go into chapter four, just a couple of verses. I want to say that the biblical message, now we're picking up off last week, we talked about the great importance of biblical preaching. And that is preaching, the preaching that God bids us. And the results of that are just incredible. The city of Nineveh was, they say, in millions in population. It was one of the biggest cities of the known day. And to have an entire community, an entire city saved, it's one of the greatest revivals we read about in the Bible. There's no doubt about that. And when we think about the biblical message of salvation, we must always remember that it is a message of great love. And I want, us to, I want to help us to understand this love a little bit more today in the sense of what we find revealed to us in the book of Jonah, chapter number three and in the chapter four. Would you please stand as we read the word of God? 
stand in honoring of the Word of God. Jonah chapter number 3. I'll start at verse number 1. I'll read to chapter number 4, verse number 2. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go in the Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now last week we talked about preaching the message that God told us to preach. That preaching has been committed unto us as a people and as a church. So Jonah arose and went in the Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and by his nobles and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and did it not. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. I'd like for us to read together verse number two of chapter four, and just that verse alone, and let us start now. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Father, thank you for this opportunity this morning to look into thy holy word. We pray that thy Holy Spirit will encourage us in our lives as only you can and we'll thank you in advance for doing that in Christ's name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. To think about the book of Jonah and its brief description, it's not real complicated, but being simple, it can be overlooked. That is wonderful truths that this book teaches us can be overlooked. We know that Jonah was a prophet. He was a servant of the Most High God, and he was a preacher. And he was called to go to Nineveh because their sin had come before the Lord and judgment was about to come. And instead of obeying God and going to Nineveh to preach the word, Jonah flees and goes the opposite way in which we would say would be towards Spain. In the midst of him fleeing from the Lord, God causes a great storm to take place. And with that, Jonah is thrown overboard because he admits his wrongdoing. He admits to these pagan men that they are in this jeopardizing situation because of his disobedience unto the Lord. They throw him overboard. While he is sinking down and drowning and dying, a fish comes and gets him. While he is in the heart of the earth, as we learned with the second message, you might want to go back and look at that, he obviously acknowledges God, acknowledges his fault, prays, and in a really a miraculous way, God brings him back up and gives him life and commissions him the second time 
to go into that great city and preach the preaching in which I bid thee. Jonah does. Jonah goes into that city, he preaches the word of God, and there is a city wide, the whole community of Nineveh is spared judgment and everybody is saved. Again, one of the greatest revivals we can read and study about is found here in the city of Nineveh during the life of Jonah, about BC 862. Now, when we really look at this, this whole story is really a story of love. It really is. God called Jonah out of love. God loved Jonah and Jonah loved him, but the call was out of love. God commissioned Jonah out of love because there were people in Nineveh whom God loved who needed to hear the word of God. God chastened and he corrected Jonah out of love. Because the Bible teaches very clearly, whom the Lord chaseth and scourgeth, he does it out of his love. God spared the city of Nineveh and there was a great revival out of love. And then Jonah comes to this place in which we just read this verse revealing one of the greatest attributes about our Creator. And that is that God is a God of love. God gives him a second chance and according to the Bible here in this particular chapter, chapter 3 and chapter 4, salvation is found. And salvation is had. And by the way, this is salvation to a Gentile community. This is salvation to a pagan society. This is not a Jewish people. There is a Jewish preacher preaching a Jewish message to a people who are not Jewish by nature, Gentile in makeup, and there is a wonderful, glorious conversion. Now, when we think of salvation, we really need to dwell upon the fact of how good God is by saving us. The word salvation means to be delivered or it's the act of saving. Now let me be careful with this definition that Webster gives us because Webster is right. Salvation does mean to be delivered. I am saved right now. I am delivered from the penalty of sin. One day I'm going to stand before my God justified, perfect in Christ. And I gotta get this old nature off of me first, and that's gotta happen by a separation of death, and my new nature will totally be that which is of Christ, and I'll be perfect before God by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by the salvation of which God offers humanity through His Son, Jesus Christ. So I am delivered from sin, but it also means the act of saving. Because sometimes God comes and knocks on your door and knocks on your door and knocks on your door. And we would ask, is God dealing with your heart since you've been coming to church? Yeah. Yeah. Have you given your life to him yet? No, but I tell you, I, he's dealing with me about salvation. There's people here today that might be a reality about. I know when I first went to church after many years, I didn't walk forward that morning. But I tell you what, God dealt with my heart tremendously. That whole week, I couldn't hardly eat right. I couldn't think right. I was really being dealt with, and I didn't understand none of this. But I knew that something was going on in my life. And when I went back that second week to church, and I knew I needed to make a move, and praise the Lord that he helped me to do that and encouraged me to do that. And I'm just very thankful for that act of saving, that working on my life, and and God is always in the act of saving. You see, Jesus, the Bible says, the Son of Man has come. It summarizes up the entire ministry of Christ. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you're lost today and you know you're lost, then I just need you to understand that you're being sought out. And, you, and by the way, you, you know you're being sought out. You can't be here lost today and not know that the Lord's not seeking you out. We're talking about something that's very authentic and very real. That's the first definition, to be delivered or the act of saving. It also means preservation from destruction, preservation from danger, preservation from great calamity. <clears throat> hell, hell is no place you want to go to. Hell is no place you want to be involved in. You don't want nothing to do with this place called hell. 
This is not a fairy tale that's made up to scare you, to provoke you to do something with God. Hell is a very real place where people go and they are tormented day and night, night and day. They are never at ease. There is no back door out. There is no second chance. Once a man or a woman goes to hell, they have no second chance in life. Their chances in life are right now. They're given to them now. They have Moses and the prophets to hear. Let them hear them. And salvation we're very blessed with. There are three things we see here that takes place with biblical salvation. And the message hasn't changed. God's grace has been active since the beginning, friend. And, and we see here a laying out of salvation. First of all, it is based off of God's love. We know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know that God commendeth his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We realize today that we have a God who loves us. Now, what does this mean though? This is where we need to elaborate a little bit. What does this mean about God's love? Well, when we talk about God, our creator, and we talk about his love, we're talking about his attributes. Attributes. An attribute is a characteristic that makes up an individual. And love would be an attribute of God. God has two sets of attributes. There are what we call his moral attributes. And then we have what we call his natural attributes. God's love, according to the Word of God and the revelation of God's Word, is revealed through His moral attributes. They are not His, his, his natural attributes. When we think of God's natural attributes, we think of, of um, different things than we do of His moral attributes, but they all work that self-same thing, and that is to see you saved. Now here in verse number two, I would like for you to look at this verse in which we read a moment ago again. Jonah replies to God once he had saved the city and spared the city of Nineveh. And Jonah says, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. Now watch. Watch this attribute of love being revealed unto us. I'm going to give you a little college stuff this morning. I'm going to give you a little a, a part of theology revealed, the doctrine of God, a, a little bit of it. But look here. I knew, knew that thou art a underlying gracious God and underlying merciful, underlying slow to anger, and underlying great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah is revealing God's character here. He is saying God is a gracious God, and this is all underneath of love. Now keep in mind where I'm at this morning. Don't lose me. Listen to me. He is saying that God is a gracious God. Nineveh was spared. This great city was spared because God was a gracious God. Number two, he was a merciful God. Number three, he is a long-suffering God. Number four, he's a kind God. And number five, he is a forgiving God. Now, the student of the Bible looks at these things very careful, carefully. Now, when we think of the natural attributes of God, you know what they are, but let me help you with them. Mainly, most people here know the three natural attributes of God, but there's really about eight. When we think about the natural attributes of God, number one, unity. Unity. That's a, that's a natural attribute of God. But yet there's another natural attribute that goes with the doctrine of unity, oneness. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. There's the Trinity. Another um, thought that falls underneath of the natural attribute of God is Trinity. He is one God, but he's in three persons. Self-existent. That's an attribute, a natural attribute of God. He's self-existent. Where did he come from? He says it's secret. He'll tell us maybe one day, but it's not to be told right now. He is self-existent. Another natural attribute that you're probably more familiar with is he's, he, he knows everything. He's all-knowing. Omniscience. God knows everything about everything right now. This is his natural attribute. Another natural attribute that you're probably familiar with would be omnipresence. God is everywhere at once. 
at all times, and he never ceases to be. He is omnipresent. Another one that I would suppose you're familiar with, he's omnipotent. Them three right there, the omnipresence of God, the omnipotence of God, and the omniscience of God, most people understand. And omnipotent means this, God is all-powerful. Well, hold it, Pastor. That don't make sense to me because Jesus said all power is given unto him in heaven and earth. Well, Jesus is God in the flesh, friend. There is no disqualification of Matthew chapter 28. It's a very legitimate, real thought, just a revelation concerning the very person or the deity of Jesus Christ, God's Son. So the natural attributes of God, unity, trinity, self-existent, omniscience, omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal. God is eternal. He's eternal. And then one more, God's immutable. These are his natural attributes. Now, I've not said a thing about love because they don't fall underneath of this as we rightly divide and study the Word of God. Love falls underneath of the category of his moral attributes. Moral attributes. Now, the moral attributes of God have three divisions. So if we looked at the word moral up here, we would have a category here, a category here, and a category here when we deal with the moral attributes of God. And it helps us to understand some things about God. One of the moral attributes of God is this, holiness. Holiness. Our God is holy, friend. I serve a holy God. I mean, his eyes cannot behold evil. I serve a holy God today, and I'm so thankful for that. But when we think about the holiness of God, then there's three things that come to our mind that the Bible teaches us. If he's a holy God, then he's got to be a just God. And he is, and his justice is perfect. And if he's a holy God, he's got to be a righteous God. And you're right, his righteousness is perfect. And if he's a holy God, then he's just. And if he's just, then he's righteous. Then where's wrath coming out of this? Oh no, friend, because God is holy, he is wrath. Yeah. The moral attributes of God. So we look under this one here, which we're not going to elaborate on. There would be holiness. It's a moral attribute which would deal with justice, righteousness, and wrath. Now, love. I'm talking this morning about we have a salvation that's based out of God's great love, and we want to explore this love. Now, we talk about love. This is another second moral attribute of God. We talk about mercy. We talk about grace. Patience, goodness, and faithfulness from God to you. From God to you. And by the way, all these are from God to us. And then the third category that we find under the moral attributes of God, you've got holiness over here, you've got love here, then right here you've got truth. Truth. The three categories that deal with, and we talk about truth, what, what would we find underneath truth? We find wisdom wisdom. Now, salvation, biblical salvation, is of the Lord totally and not, nothing of you. Salvation is of the Lord. To be delivered from sin, the act of saving, to be preserved from destruction, to be preserved from decay or corruption, it's a total act of God's love. As we think about this, I want to say, first of all, salvation is based off of God's love. Now, what does that mean when we say God is a God of love? Watch this. God seeks your life for your highest good. Don't you ever forget that. God seeks your life for your highest good. That's probably the greatest way to deal with this thought of love. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, in the latter end of that verse, God is love. We know that he loves the world. His love is not exclusive to just a few people. It's not exclusive to just a certain race. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now the objects of God's love, there's three of them. You know who his first object is? It's his dear son, Jesus Christ. God the Father loveth the Son, friend. You know who the second object is? It's you. God loves you this morning. You are the second object of his love. Do you know who the third one is today? It's those that are lost in their sin who need to be saved. Them are the three objects of God's love as we 
study and search and learn of Scripture. Now, the manifestation of the reality of this love is very, very clear. First of all, by the cross. Does not the cross manifest to us the great love that God has towards you? Does not Jesus say that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me? So the cross, and then when we think about the cross, this is a manifestation because God gave his son as an atonement, as a substitution, as a propitiation to appease his wrath so that he could die for the sins of the world so that your sins could be taken from you by your faith and trust in God's Son, Christ, and repentance toward God. They can be lifted from you and nailed to that cross where God judged sin and that the righteousness of God's Son, Jesus Christ, which falls underneath of His holiness, can be placed into your life or what we call the doctrine of imputation. It's imputed unto you. Are you with me? Amen. This is good, friend. Amen. This, is, this is, I mean, I'm glad I'm, 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 glad I'm a Christian. Aren't you? He, he's shaking his head. And he's not. He's just, yeah, I'm with you. Now, another manifestation of God's love is this. Not only a cross, but here. When I got saved and you got saved, when a man gets saved, they get a full pardon. They get a full pardon. Not just a partial pardon. You're justified. It's the doctrine of justification. When you accept God's Son, His work of grace is so thorough in your life, you are made as if you had never sinned in your life. What a wonderful blessing. What a wonderful blessing. And then we think about ministry. Another manifestation of God's love is this preaching ministry. And your soul winning ministry and your walk with God and the things you do with God, that is a manifestation of God's love. See, the world's real twisted in this thought about the revelation of God's love to some extent. But the fact of the matter is, biblically speaking, the cross and the full pardon of sin and ministering. And I'm going to tell you another uh, uh, manifestation of God's love, and that is every now and then, every now and then, not too much, but every now and then, he's got to get his belt off and he whips us and the bible says whom the lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth so every now and then god's got to get his belt out and he's got to work on us but it's still good because he's doing it out of love Amen. yeah he's doing it out of love so the manifestations of god's love now the quality of god's love as we think about this it's absolutely eternal the love of god is an eternal love when we leave this earth as we know it right now and we are with God we're going to be there for all eternity all eternity it's an eternal love it's infinite fact of the matter is if you'll recall what Paul says he says you can't comprehend this and I try I do try but I, I'm short of it and that is comprehending the love of God that he has towards us in the book of Ephesians Chapter 3, and let me quote to you verse number 19 in reference to this particular thought because it, it's something that we may not be fully aware of and I want to make sure that we are. But he says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. It passes your knowledge. And I'm saying that the love of God and the quality of it, it's infinite. It's beyond your ability to comprehend it all. You comprehend enough of it to say yes to him, but it's really so much the more. Not only is God's love eternal, not only is God's love infinite. Now, by the way, this is not for me, although it is, I mean, I'll claim it. This is for you sitting there this morning. This is what God has for you sitting there this morning looking at me. You are involved in this. His love is immutable. It's unchanging. Well, the Bible makes it very clear. Oh, one of my greatest passages in thought of um, dealing with eternal life and just the immutability of God's salvation. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? Nay, and then he goes on prior uh, after that and he says, 
For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I'm more than a conqueror. I can conquer tribulation by God's love. I conquer distress by God's love. I conquer persecution by God's love. I conquer famine by God's love. I conquer nakedness by God's love. I conquer pearl by God's love. I conquer sword by God's love. And hold it, it's even better. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, whatever it is that's bothering you, whatever it is that's got you messed up, nor things present, nor things to come, or what you may think is going to happen, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, angel, demon, Satan, seraphim, cherubim, it does not matter, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm telling you, his love is immutable. This is what God looks to you as this morning. I tell you, no wonder the Bible says we're a peculiar people. Not that we're, you know, riding a high horse. I never could ride a high horse anyway. But the fact of the matter is, we are loved by a great God. And when you understand the greatness of God's love, we love him because he first loved us. The more we understand the greatness of his love, the more it provokes us to love him back. His love is holy. His love is holy. It is holy. And I got to admit that. And I don't really understand how to accept, say that, except for if we sin, he chastens us. And that chastening us is out of his righteous, holy character. Remember I said that holiness dealt with justice, righteousness, and wrath? Okay, remember I said that? I didn't just say that to say that. I said that because that falls under the category of God dealing with his people that he is a holy God. Uh, it's incredible. God's love is just simply incredible. The conclusion would be that we love him because he first loved us. Now, this is God's love. This is his moral attribute. Now, under that is grace. Jonah says to God, was not this my argument with you from the very beginning? I know, or I knew that thou wert a gracious God. Now, let's look at this a little bit, because grace is underneath the umbrella of God's love. What are we talking about when we talk about grace? What is grace? I'm going to tell you what grace is. Um, young man, can I see you for a minute? Can you come up here as an illustration? Can you just stand right there? Okay, right there. Stop. Right there. Okay. Okay. So this young man, which we're glad to have today on the bus, we're glad you came. This young man represents the world. I'm going to represent just an illustration, God. I'm just, just illustration purposes. I'm far from that. I just, here's what grace is. Grace is any move of God toward man. Any move. Any move of God toward man. Thank you, buddy. When God moved towards you, that's grace. Because nobody here is worthy for him to step out and come our way. How often has he been there for you? Now, grace. Jonah says, I knew that thou wert a gracious God. So grace would be any move of God towards man. Paul the Apostle, when he was writing to the young preacher Titus and was equipping him for ministry after writing two letters, one to 1 Timothy and the second letter to Timothy, he wrote the book of Titus. And Paul said in chapter number 2, in verse number 11, I quote, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. You know, the Bible says we're saved by grace. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest we take it upon ourselves to boast. Not only are we saved by grace, but you know, we live by grace. Yeah, we live by grace. He told Titus that grace, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace teaches us how to live right. 
And not only does grace save us, not only does grace teach us how to live, but it is by God's grace we are kept. God's grace is what keeps us. Paul the Apostle was told this by God in his times of turmoil, in his mind, his thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient for thee. And you go back and study Paul's life, God had him the whole time. God had Paul the Apostle in his hand at all times. We are kept by grace. What is grace? Receiving what we don't deserve. Receiving what we don't deserve. You know what's up yonder, friend? A city called heaven. You know the streets there this morning are pure gold? You know there's no jails up there? You know there's no one being hurt up there? You know they're singing in perfect harmony today. They're praising the Lamb that rules and reigns forever and ever. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Heaven. Mercy is not receiving what we do deserve hell we have a gracious God Jonah admits to God you spared them and saved them because you're a gracious God well Jonah also mentions merciful in our text thou art a gracious God and merciful what is mercy mercy is withholding that which is just and due it's withholding it. It means it's a just penalty, and, and it'd be right. It would be proper if such a penalty was inflicted because of what's taken place or perfect justice. Let's use the word perfect justice being carried out. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, God's mercy is a holy mercy. Now listen, God's mercy is a holy mercy which knows how to pardon your sin, never to protect it. I'm going to say that again. You might want to listen to me there. God's mercy is a holy mercy. Remember holiness. Holiness deals with wrath, justice, and righteousness. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. God's mercy is a holy mercy which knows how to pardon your sin, but never to protect your sin. Holiness can't do that. Justice cannot do that. Righteousness cannot do that. Long-suffering. Jonah mentions here in our text that he was a gracious God, that is our God, to Nineveh. He was a merciful God and slow to anger. He was slow to anger. He's long-suffering. Long-suffering. Um... Do you think, and I don't know this, I really don't know this, but do you think that God tolerates you in any way, shape, or form? Do you have a life that God has got to tolerate from time to time or you'd be in big trouble? I mean, I don't know. I know one thing in my life, I need him to be slow to anger. Just hang out there for a minute. Let me, give me a chance to learn. Let me, let me check this out. And we see here when he says, that thou art slow to anger, long-suffering. You know, 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's long-suffering. He's long-suffering. And when we think of long-suffering, ladies and gentlemen, it means this. God exercises patience over his own wrath towards you for your good. Now, you might not be able to understand all that, but that's what this is dealing with. God exercises patience over his own wrath and forbears it to give you an opportunity. Now, that's his business. And we say, well, why did God have mercy or not? I'm not in that. That's not for me to question or answer. But I'm just saying that God is a God of long suffering. He tolerates us. He puts up with us. We don't do right. We don't live right. We're not faithful. And I don't know what can become of that. I, I mean, in the direct sense, because of mercy. I don't know if God gives a man a month to straighten that up, or he gives him a year to straighten that up, or he gives him a week to straighten that up, or he gives him an hour to straighten that up, and it's all over with. I don't know that. I don't know. I know he won't protect it. I know he will not protect it. That I do know. Now, when we think about this, again, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but it's long-suffering to usward. 
He's long-suffering to me and you. He tolerates us. Why is he long-suffering? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Jonah, isn't it amazing how this little book of Jonah is revealing so much truth about our great God? And how we miss these great truths by thinking of, you know, not of insignificant things, but maybe something that just isn't as significant. And that is the doctrinal application. Now, listen to what Nehemiah said in chapter number nine. This is, this is one of them verses that I got highlighted. And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders. And this is Nehemiah dealing with God's people, telling God's people to repent and fast because they're about ready to get things restructured. And, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah went back in rebuilding the wills, the, the walls, laying the spiritual uh, foundation for Israel to, to be back in the land as they ought to have been, as a witness to other nations as they ought to have been. He says, and they refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But, now here, I just want you to see this, but thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. You know, Jonah knew this. Jonah knew this. And what I'm saying is God exercises patience with himself regarding his power in our lives for our good. For our good. Jonah mentions here the kindness of God. The kindness of God. He says, and as we look at this in verse number four, and we're going somewhere, and of great kindness, the kindness of God. Great kindness. Can I just say this? We think about God's great kindness. Let me just say this. God is good. God is good. His creation is good. His law is good. His word is good. His providence is good. His will is good. Everything about God is good. And that deals with his kindness towards us, towards you and your particular life. Now, the attribute of God's kindness Reflects, reflects from God's perfection. That is the perfection of his nature. And it is such a perfection in which God manifests his care and concern for and in your life. That's his kindness towards you. He is perfect in his character, so he is kind to you to care for you and to love you and to do what's best for you in your life. Forgiveness. Well, Jonah doesn't say forgiveness, but he says, repentest thou of the evil. Forgiveness. God pardons offenders. If you're here today and you've sinned against God, you can get pardon, but you're only going to get it from God. You're only going to get pardon from the Lord. He is the only one that can pardon you. If you're a Christian today and you've been saved, but you're living in sin, you're living in secret sin, you, you might want to step on out of that this morning. You might want to real think what you're watching, what you're listening to, that no one else knows because God does know. And that stuff will harm you. That stuff will hurt you. And I'm just saying God will forgive you of that. He'll pardon you of that. And what does that mean when God forgives us and God pardons us? You know what that means? After he forgives you, he treats you as if you're not guilty. He treats you as if you never did anything wrong. And that's why we need to make sure that we have our fellowship lined up with the Lord and have it lined up properly. Forgiveness. Now this bothered Jonah. Can I just say this love of God bothered Jonah? This bothered him. All this stuff I'm talking about bothered this preacher. This is why I left him the first time. I knew that you were like this. Do, do you know that he's like this? Think about this. Forgiveness is based off of God's attribute of faithfulness, friend. The Bible says that his mercies are new every day. Great is thy faithfulness. Forgiveness is based off of his faithfulness, and God is faithful. Now, knowing that God is faithful to forgive us our sin does three things for you. Number one, listen carefully. Knowing that God is faithful to pardon and forgive your sin will keep you, number one, from worrying. You'd be surprised how much worrying people do and they don't know the real source of it. Worry always has a source of sin. Always. Number two, 
Knowing that God is faithful to pardon our sin not only keeps us from worrying, it keeps us from complaining. And knowing that God is faithful to pardon us from our sin will keep us content in our life. It'll keep us content in every area of our life. Content with our spouse, content with our salary, content in every area in our life. If we understand that God is faithful to pardon, we can experience living a life that doesn't have problems but is free from worry, that doesn't have opportunities to complain but keeps us from complaining and gives us great contentment. Now, salvation is based off of what? God's love. Now, I I hope you get the picture there. There's a lot here. But there's like two more things real quickly. Salvation is not only based off of God's love, but if we look at chapter 3 and verse 5, as no, Jonah went into the city a day's journey, he cried in verse 4 and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5. So the people believed God. Secondly, salvation is based off of God's love. Secondly, salvation is based off you trusting and believing in God. No one can help you here. Mom and dad can't do this for you while you're an infant. No schooling can do this for you based on your parents' credentials. You have got to make up the decision of who and how you're going to respond to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did they believe in? Well, obviously they believed in the preached word because God told Jonah, and we talked last week about the importance of biblical preaching. That message is, this is a kind of a two-part. So Jonah preached God's preaching. They believed in the preached word. I tell you another thing they believed in. had to believe in it. They believed in God's perfect righteousness and that they weren't measuring up to it. And they called for repentance. They called for sackcloth. They called for fasting. They said, turn from your evil ways. They believed in God's perfect righteousness. And they believed that a projected judgment was coming. They believed in it. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, a judgment is coming. Judgment's coming, ladies and gentlemen. Judgment is coming to this world. Don't think that this world can live and act the way it does in accordance to abusing and refusing God and get away with it. I'm not saying that to be sarcastic, nor am I saying that to where we want God to get them. I'm not saying that at all because we've already talked about God's long-suffering. It don't matter what I think about people. God's ways are not my ways in thinking. The ladies reminded us that in a song. Jonah needed to be reminded of that too, friend. He got upset because God spared him. His thinking was not the way it should have been in the direct sense. And they had belief in God's word as righteousness in this coming judgment. They had belief in his promise declared. In verse number four, and Jonah began to enter again into the day's, a day's journey into the city and cried, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, one more point here that we need to understand that's involved in biblical salvation. Love, and I just covered a whole lot about that. Trust and belief. And number three, repentance. Repentance. Is repentance found here? Oh, it's found right here, very clear, and it must always be found. The Bible says if we look here in verse number eight, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way. That's repentance. And from the violence that is in his hands, that is repentance. Repentance. What did I say last week when we entered into this particular thought? I said that the greatest opportunity and chance that we had in life for a changed life was repentance. Now you know why. Repentance is the only thing that can thoroughly change your life for the best. In the sense of God's love and belief in God's love. When we repent and put faith in Christ, there is not a change. There is a transformation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. It's a total transformation. Turn from their evil ways. Now, can I say something about this as we advance? Because I know I'm teaching and preaching from an Old Testament thought. Um, I do get that. But I want to just remind us something about the ministry of Paul the Apostle as we conclude. When Paul was with the Ephesian elders and they were all together and from Miletus he sent for these elders and he called them in Acts chapter number 20 and they were come to him. He um, was assembled together with them and is talking about how he served the Lord with all humility there and he taught them with many tears and there were temptations and how he kept back nothing that was profitable for them and that watch and that he went house to house publicly and here's what he says testifying both to the Jews 
and also to the Greeks, Gentiles, repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. That first word today has found its way out of our churches for some odd reason, and it ought not to. There is no salvation without biblical repentance. There is no salvation. So repentance means this. You acknowledge you're on a wrong way, an evil way, a bad way. And in God's sight, that's wrong. And because he's holy, just, and right, and wrathful, the only reason he is not exercising that upon your life is because he chooses to use long-suffering and control his power and be merciful unto you and give you a chance to get saved. Y'all think about that. We serve a great God, friend. We serve a great God today. We serve a gracious God. And I'm going to just tell you, I know repentance. Oh, well, you got to repent. You can't do nothing. I guess now that you're going to be a Christian, you're not going to go out with us no more on Friday night, are you? Well, it depends on where you want to go to. You want to go get an ice cream? We'll go get an ice cream. You want to go down to the dance hall? I think you go alone. Oh, I guess this means we can't go out and run like the old boys used to run anymore. Well, we can go run where you want to do. You want to go down and shoot some guns for a couple hours? We can run down to the farm and shoot some guns. Well, I'm talking about going out and turning the town upside down and painting it red. Yeah, sorry, I'm no longer involved in that stuff. Repentance is a change of mind about the direction you're on. And knowing that if you don't get off that road sooner or later, it's going to lead you to destruction. And the harmful thing about that, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, there is a way in the man that seemeth to be right, but the end is the way of death. Three things that make up God's salvation. You. You, number one. You. You make up God's salvation. His great love for you. Your trust and belief in Him. In what? Jesus died on the cross for your sin. As an atonement for you. He died in your place. He took your punishment. Instead of you going to the cross and dying, Jesus said, Father, lead them over there. I'll go for him. You'll do what? I'll... And he went up there and laid on that cross for you in your stead. And he died for your sin. They broke him. He gave up the ghost. They placed him in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose again to justify us. And he is alive today. And he has power over something that you may not have power over. And that's your worst enemy. And that's death. Do you know for sure you have power over death? The only way we can be assured they have power over death is by the gospel of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever sinned against God? Have you violated one of His commandments? Have you lied a little bitty lie or did something? Then that means that's wrong. you got to redo your thinking there. And if you're a Christian today, you might be like Jonah and you might be on the run, friend. You might be on the run today. I might be talking to some runaways today. And today, God's got your number. And God's speaking to your heart. And God's saying, why? I've been good to you. I've been merciful to you. I've been gracious to you. I've been kind to you. I've been forgiving to you. I have been um, uh, wonderfully glorious to you. And you're, why? Whatever the case may be, if you're here today and you need salvation, I want you to know that our God is ready to pardon you and give you full salvation. By believing in what his son did at the cross. If you're here as a Christian today, I want you just to appreciate how much God loves you. And appreciate the goodness that you have in your life where you're able to be in this relationship on a daily basis with a God who's able to do exceedingly above and beyond all that we can ask or think. Let's have our heads bowed, please. Thank you for listening. Father in heaven, what can we say? We serve a gracious God, a great God, a long-suffering God, a merciful God. Is there somebody here this morning who needs to be pardoned from their sin? I don't know, but you do. Is there somebody here today that needs to get saved? Is there somebody here today that needs to give their life and heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there a Christian here today who's living a life of unconfessed sin and needs to confess sin? Thou art ready to pardon. Thou art a gracious God kind, loving, merciful. Lord, we ask that you'll have your will and way in the hearts of those that hear. Amen. Let's all